This morning, for the next uh, 25 minutes or so, I'd like to speak with you or to discuss with you, to study with you in the scriptures what the Bible says regarding the divinity of Jesus. When people begin to doubt the doctrine of the Trinity or if God to be understood as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, part of the doubts that come along is usually one regarding the divinity of Jesus. Jesus is not really a divine being of all eternity, maybe equal to God in some ways, but not really inferior to God in some ways, but not equal. And he must have had a beginning at some time in the past. What I'd like to do with you this in the next few minutes is do a Bible study of what the Bible says, what the New Testament authors said about who Jesus is. Now, as I've mentioned this morning, it's not necessarily, everything is not necessarily easy to understand. There might be some things that are a little bit more complicated because God is outside of our world. God is in a different dimension and we cannot simply sit face to face at lunchtime and have a chat with him. That's not how our relationship with God functions. It's out of faith, out of prayer and, and worship. And so there's an element of mystery. Nonetheless, we know that God is active, that God does things in our lives. He's, he's doing miracles. He's answering prayers. We know God exists, but in a different way than our own existence. In our church, in our Seventh-day Adventist church, we've got a statement of fundamental beliefs. I mentioned it earlier this morning. We have one on the Trinity. And at the very beginning of that one, now for the sake of those who were not there this morning, let me say it again. In that statement on the Trinity, it says that there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. So God is immortal, all-powerful, all-knowing, above all, and ever-present. He is, however, infinite and beyond human comprehension. There are limitations to what we are able to understand about God. I think it's okay to admit that. It's okay to be humble when it comes to God. Yet, we know him through his self-revelation in Jesus and in Scripture. Now, we also have a statement of fundamental belief. It's the second, the number four, and it's on Jesus. And at the very beginning, it says God the eternal Son became incarnate in Jesus Christ. You see, early Christians, right from the beginning in the Scriptures, they believed in the divinity of Jesus. They believed that Jesus was a whole lot more than a mere human being. And they still maintained, however, that God is one. So they were monotheist. They worshipped and they confessed Jesus as God, they believed that the Father and the Son were two distinct persons, yet one. And they also believed that the Holy Spirit was understood as a distinct person. We saw the Bible verses for this earlier this morning. Yet, there are some limitations to what we're able to understand, is there? There are limitations to how we understand God because, as I've mentioned, there's a mystery that remains to some extent. Earlier this morning, I mentioned this author here. Oops, a little too fast. I mentioned this author. He is an Orthodox theologian, an Orthodox priest. And even for them, an Orthodox, um, among all the Christians that exist on earth, if there are a group of Christians who have written a lot about the Trinity, it's the Orthodox. They write a lot about this for, for generations and centuries. And here's this man saying... It's not the task of Christianity to provide easy answers to every question, but to make us progressively aware of a mystery. God, to some extent, is a mystery to us. God is not so much the object of our knowledge as the cause of our wonder. And we do wonder about God every day of our lives and in worship. So what evidence is there in Scripture that Jesus is the divine co-eternal Son of God. I'd like to do three things this morning in the next few minutes. First, I'm a, I'm a teacher, so I give you the lesson plan, and here's where we're going. First, <laughs> what is the Bible saying about Jesus being God? That will be the first. Number two, what is the Bible saying when it says that Jesus is Lord? 
that use of the word Lord when it refers to Jesus. Where does that imply? Where is that coming from? Number three, what evidence do we have in Scripture that Jesus himself claimed divinity by divine authority that he would have? Okay, that's where we're going. You're ready for Bible study? So here we go. Jesus as God. There are a couple of passages in the Old Testament, some prophecies of the Old Testament that indicated to the writers of the Old Testament, but also to the people of the period of the time of Jesus, that the Messiah would be a divine being. Not just a human being, but a divine being. And so here it is. And in this passage, it's in Micah 5, verse 2. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrata, that's the city, the town where Jesus was born. Too little to be among the clans of Judah. You're an insignificant little hamlet in South Palestine. From you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. So the Messiah who would be promised to be born in Bethlehem would not be just a simple human being, here the text includes. His goings forth, meaning his life, his existence, would be from a long time ago, from the days of eternity. Now, Hebrew does not have a good way of speaking of eternity. So his goings forth from a long ago, from the days of eternity. In other words, meaning we don't know and cannot say when he began. He has no beginning. That's what the Hebrew implies here. He has no beginning. Don't try. There isn't any. So that's Micah 5 verse 2. At about the same time as Micah, there's another prophet by the name of Isaiah. And in Isaiah chapter 9, it is said, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given. I should have quoted that passage in the King James Version, so we could have sang it as the Handel's Messiah sings it at Christmas time. Uh, you remember that, the, I mean, this is a, a, a passage that Handel's Messiah is using in the beginning of, of the, uh, the beautiful presentations that people do at Christmas. For a child shall be born to us, a son shall be given to us, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. What are the titles of the Messiah according to this passage? Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That is who the Messiah would be according to Isaiah. Now he's not confusing the Messiah and Father, but he's indicating here a close relationship between the two. So Jesus, this Messiah according to Isaiah, would be Mighty God. That, that, that's who he would be. So for, for, for people, when Jesus came along, the Messiah came along in, in the time of Jesus, they already had in their minds that this Messiah would be a divine being. I could quote some other passages like Daniel and, and the prophecies of Daniel that also used terminology that referred to the Messiah in ways that indicative that he would be a divine being. But let's go to the New Testament. I read in scripture reading a moment ago this passage from John in chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Now something that is very interesting in Greek literature, a little bit in Hebrew as well, but particularly in Greek, is a way of writing. People have a way of writing that is called a... a don't, don't mind a technical word, it's called a chiasm. The Greek alphabet has a letter that is called chi, C-H-I, chi. The shape of that letter is an X. It's an X. And Greek writers very often wrote using the metaphor of the letter chi. So it's like in the shape of an arrow, like you see here on the screen. It's the shape of an arrow. 
And what happens is that when they write, what, what's the real point of what they're trying to say in that sentence, in that verse or that paragraph, is the point of the arrow, so the, the middle of the X. And what you have before, what you have after, is an echo of one another. So you have it right here in this passage. Look carefully. In the beginning was the word. And then in verse 2, it's repeated again at the very end. And then the second phrase, and the word was with God. And it's repeated again in verse 2. He was with God. But the point of the arrow, the, the core of the X, the middle of the chi here, is the point that the author wants to, be, to, to make. The word was what? God. Something else happens here in the Greek language is that in that little phrase, and the word was God, there is no article, just like we have it in English, there is no article before the word God. And in Greek, when you've got the verb to be, was, and you've got a word that has an article, but the other word does not have an article. So the word has an article, that's the verb to be, then the second word does not have an article in the Greek. When you have that kind of a sentence construction, in the case here of this chiastic structure, the word God here is not only referring to a being that is God, it's referring also to the essence of what God is. So it's much more than saying Jesus is God. It is also indicating, implying that Jesus is the very divine essence of what God is all about. It's strong. It is a strong statement that John is giving right at the beginning of the Gospel of John. Now there is more to that. Gospel of John begins with what two words, or what three words? In the beginning. What other book of the Bible begins that way? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Now it's not, it's not by chance here. It's on purpose. John is beginning the gospel, writing it this way, because he wants to echo Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In other words, here what John, and, and, and in Genesis chapter 1, how is the world created? And God said, let there be light. The word of God creates the world in Genesis chapter 1. What John is doing here is saying to the readers of the gospel, in the beginning, the word of God is what created the world. Because the word of God is itself God or himself. God, the very essence of God. Now, if you want to be theoretical, if you want to be abstract, if you want to be theological, this is it. I could close this Bible study. We're done. This is it. There is no stronger evidence in Scripture to tell us that Jesus is the very divine Son of God, that he himself is divine by essence. Wow. But what I like also is to learn from stories. We are in Newfoundland. When I did college and university, I had Newfoundland friends. Earl is one of them back there. And you were there, your brother-in-law, your sister, you know, Gary Hodder, and, 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 and I had plenty of friends who were from Newfoundland when I was in college in Alberta. And they always told stories. They, they always had a story to tell about their lives, about their parents, about their grandparents, about their village, about this and about that. They always had stories. Newfoundland, Trudy, Newfoundland is a land of stories. It's a culture of stories. There's the author right there. There's, uh, stories are part of your culture. You teach things through culture. And I see all these Ghanaian people here in the audience. You've come from Africa. Africa is full of cultures that are based on stories. You teach through stories. There's always a, a meaning in the stories. Well, let's turn to a story in John chapter 8. John chapter 8 is a beautiful story where something even 
perhaps even stronger than John chapter 1, happens. And we get the meaning of what is happening here, what Jesus tells about himself being God through a story. So let's go into the story. Jesus has just healed somebody, and the scribes and the Pharisees come to argue with Jesus. How can you do this? You did this on the Sabbath. You're not supposed to do that, and so on, so on, so on. So the argument begins, and so we go to the crux, uh, the, the, the end of the argument. And Jesus says to them, oh, come on, stop arguing. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. So God in vision showed to Abraham that one day the Messiah would be there. He saw it. Abraham saw my day. And he was glad. Oh, come on. Hey, come on. You're not even 50 years old, the Jews said to him. And you've seen Abraham? That you can talk about him like this as, as if you, you talked to Abraham? Are you out of your mind? I mean, I mean, the meaning here is basically they're saying to Jesus, you're crazy. Why should we listen to you? Well, I tell you the truth, Jesus said, answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself slipping away from the temple grounds. What's happening here? Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was born, I am. What Jesus is doing here is that he is quoting from Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. Another story. He's alluding to another story. Moses is at the burning bush. And God is giving a mission to Moses to go back to Egypt to free the Hebrew slaves from Egyptian captivity. And Moses says, I can't do it. I, it. This is too big of a task for me. And and you know what? I don't even know who you are. And they're going to ask me, who is this God that is sending you back to Egypt, supposedly the God of the Hebrews, to liberate the Hebrews from Egyptian slavery? Who are you? And God says to Abraham, well, tell them, I am who I am has sent you. That's my name, Yahweh. What Jesus is doing here is that he is quoting the name of God in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. Before Abraham was born, I am. He is referring to the name of God in the Old Testament. And what he's doing here is one more thing. Not only is he referring to that name, but he is claiming to have been the one who talked to Moses in the burning bush. That's what he's doing. Before Abraham was born, I'm the one who talked to him in the burning bush. I am. So Moses, uh, so, so Moses saw God, had this relationship, wrote what happened at the burning bush. Jesus is having this confrontation with the scribes and the Pharisees uh, about, you know, doing miracles and, and, and so on. And they're doubting who Jesus is. And Jesus tells them through a story, I am. I'm the one who gave all of these prophecies to Abraham and, and talked to Moses. I'm the one who liberated our ancestors from slavery in Egypt. I am who I am. Well, that is big. That is huge. Jesus claims to be the Yahweh of the Old Testament. Now, how do we know that that's what he means? That he's just not simply referring to God the Father. Like before Abraham was born, I was with the Father. How, how, how do we know that that's... You know, there might be some nuances there. How do we know that? Stories. Stories tell us what's happening. What happens next? Jesus doesn't need to say anything more. At this, after hearing this comment from Jesus, what happened? They picked up stones to what? Stone him. They picked up stones to stone him. There is no doubt that the listeners understood 
what he had just said. In the Old Testament, there are a couple things that people were supposed to be stoned for if they did that kind of a crime. And one of them is what? Blasphemy, to take the name of God in vain and to pretend to be God. They took up stones to stone him. What does that say to you? What does the story say to you? They got the point. They understood that Jesus had just claimed to be the Yahweh of the Old Testament. And they would not put up with it. They did not believe it. They picked up stones to kill Jesus. In fact, that is one of the reasons why Jesus will be crucified, is that the Jewish leaders refuse to accept his claims as the divine Messiah. So, wow, we have it here. I'm sorry, I forgot to change the slides back there. There we go. They picked up stones to stone him. Yes. So, another strong statement that gives us the evidence from the New Testament. But we need to move on. There are some other passages of the New Testament that affirm that Jesus is God. Let's go to the very end of the Gospel of John. It's the day, or a week later after the resurrection. Thomas was not there the day that Jesus was erected. He was not in the upper room to see the resurrected Jesus. He said, well, unless I see him and can touch him, I'm not going to believe what you're saying to me. A week later, Jesus comes back. He presents himself to Thomas. And Thomas's reaction is, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. I'm going to come back to the word Lord in a moment. But his reaction is a moment of worship. And now he understands Jesus is not only the Messiah, he is also God. This is a confession on the part of Thomas. Let's look at Paul. Paul in Colossians chapter 2, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. So in the image of a man, in the incarnation, the fullness of the divinity is in Jesus. Partial divinity, a little bit of it, 95% of it, fullness of the divinity is in Jesus. Let's go to Romans chapter 9. At the end there, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Messiah according to the flesh who is over all God, blessed forever. Amen. So Paul here intimates that the Messiah according to the flesh is also God, blessed forevermore. Titus chapter 2 verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. So Christ Jesus is great God and Savior. That's Paul and Titus, but the same thing is about very close to in 2 Peter chapter 1. To those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So you have a number of authors, again, in the New Testament, who certify that Jesus is truly God. You got the stories, you got John, you got Peter, you got Paul, beautiful things. So we do know that the scriptures accept Jesus as God, as divine being. But let's move on. I see the time is going along here. Number two, the word Lord. What does the word Lord imply? In Luke chapter two, at the very beginning there of the stories about Jesus and the angels said to them, the shepherds, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, or the Messiah the Lord. Now the interesting things here, here's perhaps a, a theological statement from one of my colleagues, Paul Peterson, where he explains that in the Jewish time, I'll just summarize what the statement says, in the time of the Jews, and still today, the practice has not changed. When Jewish people read the Bible in the Hebrew, or even in the English, and they see the name of God, Yahweh, in the Hebrew, they will not 
say the word as they read. So they're reading in the Hebrew, and they come to the word Yahweh. They will not pronounce that word. Instead, they will say the word Lord, Adonai. It's a Greek word. They will say the word Adonai. So they read, 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 Adonai, and they continue to read. So instead of saying the word God, Yahweh, they will say the word Adonai. And the word Adonai in the Greek means Lord. So in their minds, so in the minds of the readers of the Bible, when you have the word Lord, it's a direct reference to the name of God, but well, an indirect reference to the name of God. Instead of pronouncing it, you say the word Lord instead. That's basically what it is. So when you hear the name of the Lord, it's a Hebrew reference that people will say instead of saying the very name of God. Why do they do that? It is respect for the name of God. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord your God in vain to the extent that you don't even say the name of the Lord. And that way you're sure to not to take it in vain. So you don't even pronounce it. It's, that's how they keep the third commandment. So what do we have here? Well, in a number of Bible passages, the word Lord is referred to to refer to Jesus. Indirectly, that's a reference to the God of the Old Testament. So John the Baptist and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, and for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. Reference to Jesus being the Lord of the Old Testament. In the book of Acts, oh, the word Lord happens many times. And even in Acts chapter 9 alone, in Luke's narrative of Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus and the baptism by Ananias, the name Lord is used eight times to refer to Jesus. Eight times, just in chapter 9 of, of the book of Acts. And here's an example. Here's this passage. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a true disciple. They thought that Paul was just a spy. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him. So who did he see on the road to Damascus? Well, he saw Jesus. But the word Lord is used. He saw the Lord on the road to Damascus who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus so that he went out in and out among them at Jerusalem, boldly, again, preaching in the name of the Lord. That's Hebrew. That's a Hebrew way of referring to God. The name of the Lord is the word Yahweh, but you don't pronounce it because you're respectful of the name. So a number of times in the book of Acts, Jesus is referred to as the Lord. That's another indication that early Christians understood the Messiah to be divine, to be the Son of God, to be God himself. One more, one last one, a few last few verses. The divine authority that Jesus has. Again, we learn this through stories. There are a number of places in the scriptures where Jesus does things, actions, and these actions can only be done by God. A human being cannot do that, but God can. So here we go. A couple of them, just three or four examples. In Mark chapter 2, forgiving sins. It's the faith of the paralytic. Four men bring a paralyzed man to Jesus. You remember the story? They open up the roof of the house and they lower the man right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does he say this? Why does he talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? That's right. They were right. Their theology is right. Only God can forgive sins. I can forgive a sin of someone who's done something wrong to me, but I cannot forgive the sins of someone you have wronged 
or that the sin's between you and someone else. I, I can't do that. But Jesus can. Why not? Why can't he? Because he's God. So Jesus claims here divinity to be able to forgive the sins of somebody he's never met before, but also the people around understand the story. There's a story being told here. And in the story, it is affirmed rightly through the voice of those who don't agree with Jesus that Jesus claims divinity. That's right. He claims divinity. And we hear that from those who don't agree with him. Let's look at another one. At the end of Matthew, uh, in chapter 25, there is a story giving to us a, a parable that Jesus gives us of the judgment. And at the very end of that parable, he, he tells us who is going to be the judge on the day of the judgment. Now, if you've read your Old Testament, and you know it fairly well, you know that the judge on the day of the judgment in the Old Testament is God. But here in Matthew 25, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will judge, separate the sheep from the goats. So Jesus has the authority of the judge at the end of time. But that's God's authority. He has it. One more. It's in John chapter 5. Again, again it is through a story where Jesus claims to be the Son of God. And, and, and here again, the detractors, those who don't agree with Jesus, are the ones telling us what this is all about. It's a strange way of telling stories, but it, it works. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him. Jesus said to them, My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too, I'm working in the work of salvation. For this reason, there you go, you got the detractors here. The detractors will tell us why they're upset with Jesus. For this very reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him, not only because he was breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. The detractors tell us the point of the story. They hate Jesus. They want to get rid of him because they know that's what he claims. He claims to be God, equal with God. Stories tell us what this is all about. So when I read Scripture, when I read the New Testament, when I try to understand these stories of the, of the New Testament, I get the distinct impression here that the authors of Scripture, the Gospel writers, Paul, Peter, and many others, understood that Jesus was the divine Messiah and his divinity is the same as God the Father. They understood that. That's what they understood. And that's what they wrote about. I think, therefore, I conclude that our faith is secure when we believe the same thing. We're not building on sand. We're building on a good foundation when we also agree with that, also accept that. I'm not saying it's easy to understand, but I'm saying this is the simple way of understanding Scripture. So let me end with a couple statements from Ellen White. I'll refer to them again this afternoon, but let me end with that. First one, Desire of Ages, on page 530. Whoops, I need to change the slide. Right here, this one, and then one more. This story, or this little paragraph from the book, The Desire of Ages, is where Ellen White gives a commentary on the resurrection of Lazarus. You remember the story, John chapter 11. It's a, it's a great miracle. Jesus is re resurrecting his friend, Lazarus, three days after he's dead. And there's, in that narrative, Jesus has a conversation with Martha. Martha believes that Jesus will do the resurrection at the end of days. She believes in the resurrection, but Jesus wants to go a little further. Still seeking to give a true dead direction to her faith, Jesus declared it to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And there Ellen White pauses, and she inserts her commentary. What does that mean? I am the resurrection and the life. In a true, good, orthodox, traditional Christian understanding of what that means, 
Ellen White says, in Christ is life, original, unborrowed, underived. It was not given to him by anybody. He did not get it by osmosis or somehow. No, 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 no. The life that Jesus has and with which he is able to do the resurrection, it is his very own, and he's always had it. It's original with him. And then she continues. He has the Son, has life. The divinity of Christ is the believer's, is your assurance of eternal life. Let that sink into you. We have the assurance of eternal life because of who Jesus is. Not only because he can resurrect us on, on the day of the resurrection, not only he gives us life because he forgives our sins, we have the assurance of eternal life because of who Jesus is. Not only what he does, but who he is. We believe in a savior who is God himself. One last passage. Pastor, if you can help there, go to the very, very last slide of my PowerPoint. I don't want to skip with my clicker through 20 slides. Let's go to the very last one. Another beautiful statement from Ellen White. I'll end with this one. The incarnation of Christ, his divinity, his atonement or dying for us on the cross, his wonderful life in heaven as our advocate, the office of the Holy Spirit, all these vital themes of Christianity are revealed from Genesis to Revelation. Each is a golden link in the perfect chain of truth. Our belief that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that the Spirit is a person, our comforter, our guide in our Christian life, that Jesus is the eternal Son of God, very God, all of these beliefs our true good Christian beliefs and our faith can be established by believing in them and hanging on to them. It is part of our assurance of salvation. May God bless you as you, as you have a strong faith that you, you hang on to who God is and you hang on to who Jesus is. Amen. Amen.